Hello and welcome to another TLDR Explains video on the coronavirus. In this one, we're going to be taking a look at some prospective treatments for the virus, starting at drug therapies, then going on to vaccines, and finally hyperimmune globulin. Before we get going, I want to let you know that our series, Opinionated, is about to return. Last year we asked you what you thought about a second referendum, foreign aid, burqa bans and weed legislation. For this series, we want to know your thoughts on universal basic income, the cost of university, nuclear power, and whether the UK should adopt a written constitution. We have the survey up now, it's linked down below, so tell us what you think and have your views featured in the new series. Also, everyone who completes the survey will get entered into an instant win competition, where everyone wins something, with prizes ranging from discounts in our merch store, to vouchers, to even free badges. So fill out the survey and get your prize now. So let's take a look at some prospective therapies. On March 18th, the World Health Organization started trials on what it considers to be the four most promising options. Chloroquine, and a closely related derivative called hydroxychloroquine. Remdesivir, which was developed by Gilead to treat Ebola. Lopinavir and ritonavir, which are typically used to treat HIV as well as lopinavir and ritonavir in combination with interferon beta, which stimulates cell synthesis of antiviral proteins. So let's start with chloroquine. Chloroquine and its derivative, hydroxychloroquine, are typically used to treat malaria. Chloroquine is a lysometropic, which means that it accumulates in lysosomes. Lysosomes are organelles within your cells that contain digestive enzymes. They're more acidic than the rest of your cell, and viruses often use their replication cycles. Chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine work by neutralizing the pH of the lysosome and inhibiting viral replication. Anyway, you might have heard something about it in the news because Trump certainly likes talking about it. On Saturday 4th, he advised people to take it, saying, what do you have to lose? Take it. And the next day justified his advice by saying that in France, they just had a very good test. The French study he's talking about comes from Marseille and involved just 42 patients. The French doctors chose hydroxychloroquine instead of chloroquine because it has a better long-term safety profile and also allows for higher daily dosage. 26 patients were given the drug, while the 16 remaining were used as a control. Six of the 26 had to leave the trial, three went into intensive care, one stopped taking it because of nausea, one left the hospital and one died. But of the remaining 20, they seemed to recover faster than the control group of 16, according to data gleaned from nasal swabs. Obviously, this isn't good evidence that hydroxychloroquine can treat the coronavirus. It's only a tiny sample. It wasn't done blind, and most importantly, 15% of the treatment group went into intensive care or died, compared to 0% of the control group. And that's not to say that it won't work at all. Promisingly, the Wuhan Institute of Virology has proved its effectiveness against coronavirus in vitro. We just don't know for sure that it will work in practice. Remdesivir was originally intended to treat Ebola, but it's now being touted as a potential coronavirus cure. At the time of writing, there are currently eight clinical trials investigating it as a treatment. Adenosine is one of the building blocks of viral RNA, and Rodesimir looks a lot like it. The virus tries to build new RNA and lets Rodesimir in, thinking that it's adenosine, but because it's not, the RNA it creates becomes useless. Like hydroxychloroquine, the Wuhan Institute of Virology has proved its effectiveness against coronavirus in vitro, and Gilead has shown it to work on SARS and MERS in monkeys. There have also been reports of it working in humans, like the 79-year-old Italian who was apparently cured, but nothing definitive as of yet. A recent study at the University of Kent suggested that it might be more effective when combined with omeprazole, which is usually used to treat heartburn. Lopinavir is what's known as a protease inhibitor. Proteases are enzymes used by viruses in replication. Lopinavir binds to these proteases, changing their shape and preventing the virus from using them to replicate. And ritonavir basically just makes the lopinavir last longer. While this combination did work against SARS, a preliminary trial conducted in Wuhan in March seemed to suggest that it didn't have any effect on the coronavirus. There is hope that when combined with interferon beta, which is a protein that the body naturally produces, which induces cell synthesis of antiviral proteins, that there might be more promising results. But again, nothing definitive. 
So those are the front runner drugs, at least according to the World Health Organization. However, most of these are being touted as treatments, not cures, which means they won't actually get rid of the coronavirus. To do this, we'll likely need to develop a vaccine. Traditional vaccines work by giving the body a dead or weakened form of the virus. Viruses have surface proteins known as antigens, and your body's immune system produces antibodies which combine to these antigens and kill the virus. Your immune system knows which antibodies to produce, having fought the disease. Then, in the future, your immune system now knows which antibodies to produce if it's reinfected, which makes fighting the virus much easier the second time round. There are lots of companies currently working on a traditional vaccine, but no traditional vaccine will be available for at least a year, if not 18 months, according to the World Health Organization. Perhaps more interesting is the prospect of an RNA vaccine. RNA vaccines don't give your body a dead form of the virus. Instead, they literally give your body strands of RNA. RNA strands are like instructions for cells, and RNA vaccines instruct cells how to build the antigen that's normally found on the surface of the virus. Your body then produces the antigen itself, and then produces the antibodies to bind to that antigen. If you're then infected by the virus, your body recognizes the same antigens and produces the appropriate antibodies. RNA vaccines have a couple of advantages over traditional vaccines. Firstly, they're safer because you're not actually getting infected by the virus, just its surface proteins. Secondly, they can be easily and quickly mass-produced. However, RNA vaccines have been successfully proven to work in monkeys, but never in humans. Nonetheless, the U.S. National Institute of Health is currently working with Moderna, a Boston biotech company, to try and produce exactly this. And the FDA looks likely to approve it, given that they've said that they intend to use all of the regulatory flexibility granted to it by Congress to ensure the most efficient and timely development of vaccines to fight COVID-19. Therefore, an RNA vaccine could be available earlier than traditional one. Finally, let's talk about hyperimmune globulin. Hyperimmune globulin is antibody-rich blood plasma from recovered patients. Basically, once you've had the coronavirus and recovered, your blood has coronavirus antibodies flowing through it. The technology isn't fully developed yet, but the idea is that you could donate some of your antibody-rich blood, which will then be filtered into just your blood plasma and the antibodies, which we call hyperimmune globulin. If you take this hyperimmune globulin and put it in someone else's bloodstream, you make them immune to the virus. It's worth noting that hyperimmune globulin only grants passive immunity because your body isn't producing the antibodies itself, it's sort of just being given them. This means that while you can get immediate immunity, it only lasts as long as the antibodies because your body can't produce any replacements. This is unlike vaccines, which grant active immunity meaning the body knows how to produce the antibodies itself, and the immunity lasts a lot longer. While hyperimmune globulin is great, it does come with some ethical issues. It can't be manufactured in the lab, and it has to come from someone, which means that you have two options. Either you treat the hyperimmune globulin as a person's property, or you run a volunteer exclusive scheme. A volunteer exclusive scheme would mean that you could donate hyperimmune globulin for free and the government would have control over how it was distributed. The advantage of this option is that those who need it most get it. Whereas if you let people choose who to give or even sell their hyperimmune globulin to, this means that family members, or if you're selling it, the rich, get the immunity and bad luck if you're not in one of those camps. However, the advantage of this option is that people are a lot more likely to donate their hyperimmune globulin if they either get to sell it or at least get to control who it goes to. Anyway, I'm sure you can already see how this could end up being a controversial system if it ends up being developed as an effective treatment or vaccine. Anyway, those are the headline contenders in the forms of both treatments, vaccines and hyperimmune globulin. If you want more updates on the coronavirus as they play out, then be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified every time we release a video. You can also get more from us across all social networks simply by searching for TLDR News. And special thanks to our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible.